something that's been provided in the discussion document and we had to prepare and make submissions on the basis of inadequate information. And we believe that the detailed information to be included in the audit report is contained fully in our submission. We thought that a regulatory impact assessment is required to determine, amongst others, the following. What exactly is going to be the impact of LNU? On which markets and which consumers? Essentially, what is the cost, the benefits and risks associated with unbundling of the local? Some of the questions that a regulatory impact assessment would answer is the possible unintended consequences and whether the authorities set objectives will be achieved. <coughs> These will be consider, considering as an example. As a country, we had a problem where we promulgated mobile number portability was put in place in law in 2002 amendment. It was implemented six years later. That policy leg actually indicated the uselessness of mobile number motivated. The impact could possibly have been greater if it was implemented <coughs> just after the time that it was and it's basically the same thing, even though a policy direction has been issued in the last year or two. The issue of local group unbundling has been there as early as the early 2000s. And now it's being implemented 11 years later, 10 years later, if I'm not exaggerating. And that policy lag has got its own impact. Isn't it possible that there may be just other methods to be applied <coughs> or put in place in order to address what your objectives are. The purported access line deficit should be verified and this quantity should be determined on an independent basis. Because based on the current information that we have, as what well, I call, we're not willing to contribute to us that recovery. However, should there be an access line deficit, then the authority should explore and evaluate all alternative methods of its recovery and in consultation with industry develop a way forward. Now I come to the answering of the specific questions that the authority has posed. I want to read what, what is written in the question, in question one. <coughs> on the feasibility, reasonableness, and acceptability of facilities missing regulation. We took a position that we are not really in a position to comment on the reasonableness and feasibility of the council's proposed approach based on the information that has been provided to us. The intention to utilize facilities missing regulations to unbundle the local loop is acceptable in so far as it relates to unbundling facilities as defined. The obligation to list facilities in terms of Section 431 only applies to facilities as defined in the Act. And in order to give effect to the facilities missing regulation for the purposes of LNU, we have indicated that the prior to this, because has indicated the need to have supplement other regulations. What form of LLU do stakeholders realistically favor in the South African market? We believe all four, as we have indicated before, should be made available. And the access seeker will have the discretion to determine which form they want to access in a given situation. But other cost items should be included in each form of LLU. We believe the requirement to provide other cost items is not useful for the purpose of this discussion. As the authority stated, there's no intention to address pricing beyond non-discrimination. 
where required transparency in respect of what telecom charges itself in order to ascertain the application of non-discrimination. It should be noted that notwithstanding the non-discrimination requirement, the access provider will not necessarily provide all four forms to themselves or its subsidiaries, which means that no comparable charge will be available in order to assess adherence to the non-discrimination requirement. So the standardized ordering system and specification system be developed. We support the development of that standardized ordering system specification similar to the one developed under the mobile number protocol. We think it will be helpful. Besides that, a code of practice and operation manual is appropriate should also be developed, either by the industry or together with the regulator, or like by the regulator. And this could include technical and operational requirement, which some of them were recommended in, by the LLU committee result. The last question is that, in the event that an access line deficit is identified, will it be, would you be willing to contribute to an access line deficit recovery system? We believe that the following information is necessary to, to access whether to contribute even though we've taken the position that we've taken. Number one, what that definition of the access line deficit would be? How did it arise? What is its size? Is it increasing or decreasing? What's the methods that has been used in this calculation and the modeling thereof? Or what other options were considered in addressing the access line deficit? And lastly, the implications of the various options. Like I uh, try to short, shoot straight. And I thank you, Chair, who are ready to take questions. Myself and the panel with me will answer any questions that are coming. Thank, thank you very much for coming. You allowed us plenty of time to ask you lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, could you please expi expand on your view that a peace room is a service and not a facility from a legal point of view? Um, we're happy for you to ask the questions one at a time. It rather depends on your definition of the word bitstream, but the common understanding of a bitstream is essentially uh, providing communications services across an existing facility such as a transmission medium. And you're essentially taking uh, a subset of services that are available to you within that uh, transmission medium, for example, and uh, you are providing that as a service to a specific subscriber. So you're doing that not through the physical medium per se, but through a configuration which allows you to generate pseudo capacity within that physical configuration for a specific set of users and hence since it's not in essence the technical infrastructure that you are providing but the service that is per se the classification of, of streaming as a service uh, the way of really expressing it yeah thank you chairperson uh, the supplemental regulation that you are proposing uh, in terms of section 44M, subsection 3, are you suggesting that uh, it be a standalone regulation or can we simply augment the existing facilities list of regulations? Well, I'll, I'll ask one minute to add, but we, we believe that there already is a facilities list of regulation. The reason you call it supplementary, supplementary to that facilities missing regulation. 
So it, it adds on one end or it expands on certain conditions of the existing facilities regulation and follows the, the, the specification in law under section 44 3M. Not Amanda I agree with um, I agree with um, Pakemili's view in that um, we suggest supplementary regulation because of the fact that the facilities regulations are already there. But in terms of um, section 44.3, it says that matters which electronic communication facilities using regulations may address are not limited to, and then it includes under M um, basically the manner in which unbundled electronic communication facilities are to be made available. So therefore, um, it could have been provided as part of the facilities regulations, but because that's finalised, it's maybe better to have a supplementary regulation. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question goes like this. A submission has been made to the authority that it has no explicit or implicit powers uh, emanating from the ECA that empowers the authority to undertake the LED process. What is your view to that submission? If, if uh, Chair, I go according to the views we have received on, on a number of issues, it, it's a very tricky question to answer. <laughs> purely because we ourselves have sought a number of senior councils views on on a number of the issues or regulations that the ECASA has put in place. And unfortunately, part, part of, of the problem we have, we have received in some instances, views from senior council that say actually regulator can prescribe regulation on any matter. However, on the other hand, we've also received senior council's views that say that's not necessarily true. Which means the, the dilemma we have, we've had that dilemma is what I call is that Ultimately, some of those issues can only be tested in a court of law. That if in that view, we're not saying we will <laughs> litigate you if you take it, but we have had those, those different I think with regard to, I, d I don't believe that there's an explicit provision in the regulations dealing with local loop and land bundling so far. However, with regard to um, you know, should there be a, a need to unbundle the local loop because of a bottleneck or reasons, then except for section 43.1 and the obligation provided there on for facilities leasing, I think the chapter 10 process is available um, sort of also for that purpose. In the discussion document, we look at the formation of two working groups, one on technical issues and one on pricing, within the framework of the facilities leasing regulation. Now, part of our thinking around that is that those groups would get to grips with the kind of uh, technical issues that, that you raise in your submission, quite possibly would seek to uh, audit the state of the let's say the fixed line network in this regard, um, and then come up with uh, the broad um, guidelines or approach that would be taken. Now that would not necessarily result in a supplementary regulation in terms of 44.3M. It could result in uh, a practice note. Uh, do you think that would be a problem? Or do you think that the outcome of such working groups should then inform a, a supplementary regulation in terms of um, 44.3M? Well, I think Amanda will, will add. The, the view we have, Chair, is that whilst the, the, the working groups could do the work, one way or another, the, even if you promulgate a practice note, all that had happened is that it was the work of working groups. And there, there needs to be a further discourse by, by everybody in the public 
I'm not sure whether you issue practice note as a, as a draft practice note and such that people then comment on it because it comes for, from specific working groups and other people may not have participated in that. And the, the, I think the, the appropriate procedure may be that whatever comes out of the working groups is also put in the public domain for comments where there is that substantive that yeah, ultimately it may result in a practice note because you have started using practice notes as a regulator. But I wonder can you can add. I think for me it would also be with regard to sort of what is the intention um, with the document or the, the guidelines to be published. If there's an intention to actually have a binding set of, of guidelines, then um, my recommendation would be that, that it should be in the form of a regulation. Whereas a practice note is not something that has um, force of law. So from, from that perspective, it would not be a binding, a binding document. So I think from that it stems, it, it depends on what the intention is. If, if it's something that, that is just sort of a set of guidelines that sort of can be followed voluntarily or not, um, then probably a practice note can suffice. However, if there's a requirement for it to be binding and to set out a specific set of rules, in that instance, um, I think a regulation, supplementary regulation, would be required for that purpose. Just coming back to the bitstream issue, um, right, so if I understand right, you're okay with bitstream being considered as a form of LLU, but you're also saying it's not a facility. Can you ex explain, expand on that difference? Okay, so thanks. Um, the four options for LLU, Bitstream is one of them. Now the authority has decided to facilitate LLU by using the facilities leasing regulation. So that's not taking away from the four options for local loop unbundling. But we just feel that the facilities leasing regulations only apply to facilities as defined in the, a in the ECA. And our understanding of facilities is that three of the options fall within that definition. The fourth, which is Bitstream, does not fall within the definition of a facility. So the facilities leasing regulation cannot be used for Bitstream. If I can, if I can maybe just um, add on to what Mortimer is saying. I think internationally, and that's what we've also indicated. Internationally, Bitstream is regarded as one of the forms of local loop unbundling. However, I think internationally, the, um, they don't have, you know, normally, the facilities leasing obligation, 40, uh, which is contained in um, 431, is not um, something that generally appears in international law. So from that perspective, I think South Africa is a little bit um, different in that um, here we've got um, 43.1 to use because that obligation is already there with regard to facilities. However, uh, the normal practice would be to follow sort of the market review process in order to unbundle the, lo uh, the different forms of, of local loop unbundling. And therefore, we have to sort of um, differentiate bedstream from the other forms of, of local loop unbundling within South Africa. In your presentation, you stated that the energy is outdated. Uh, what alternative does Vodacom propose to achieve universal services, fair price, and technology adoption? License more spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> put, put more players into the play. Look, um, the only reason. Well, using the term outdated, maybe I must not say outdated, I must just simply say it's dated. Whatever that means. But the, the issue is there has been a policy lag. What you may want to achieve may possibly be achieved by the other means at your disposal. Already you have introduced the current precedent. It's jumping hopes. It's one of the 
measures, not necessarily addressing the same thing, but they are supposed to provide different modes of operation at the retail level. If the issue, it, it depends on what your objectives are. Because if the issue is, is about putting more competition into the space, yeah, you may have to consider how fast do you license other new players with the spectrum that's available or you provide the spectrum to everybody or it's provided on, on the wholesale level, an open access system or something like that. That's one way. Other, other methods that may perhaps be, be considered. In other jurisdictions, there's MVNOs that are there to, well, increase the competition at the retail level. Presently, people are able to access on a roaming basis if they want to do anything in that space. All we're saying is that this may not necessarily lead, need, yield the objectives that are said are wanted by the unbanking of the local that you may need to cast your net wider to say what are the issues that you need to do in order to achieve the objectives that you've set yourself. Second question. Uh, on your submission, page nine, uh, in relation to the discussion of the client um, 2.2.4 uh, recommendation, uh, the authority's recommendation that uh, physical inspection of income, uh, you recommend that we should do uh, physical inspection uh, to the incumbent uh, premises. Would you like this to be an ongoing process? And how does this differ with the auditing of the fixed land loop you have proposed? Well, it, it doesn't, as long as it yields a, a clearer picture of what is it that is there. The audit or the inspection or the total date of the audit and the inspection may yield a much more complete picture that could then be put in the, in the, well, in the domain of the access seekers so that they know exactly what's available in what form what needs to be done in order to make sure that it's viable. But it's, it's additional and complementary. If I, if I can also, in that regard, just refer to, to our submission, I think um, sort of what we allude to is it might be, it might be necessary to also have access um, to the premises um, subsequent to unbundling for the purpose of dispute re um, resolution. So I think sort of that is also indicated in our submission. If I may ask a follow-up question on that, would you not say that it's in uh, incumbents' interests to transparently tell us what is there now without us having to do an audit? <laughs> the reputation says a lot. <laughs> I, I, I think fundamentally the, Whilst on one hand, we, you can say it may be in the interest of the incumbent to do that. Some of the questions that we have posed, especially using the facilities leasing regulation, how do you really determine whether there's any discrimination when you don't have sight of certain things? You don't have a base to work on. And you are supposed to trust what you are being told. I'm not saying you should trust what you are saying is whatever, whatever, but where there's a certain level of an independent activity, that independent activity is likely to be more trusted. And the regulator is the bail body that is supposed to be independent. And if the regulator does that, it, it gives us that assurance. Are you telling me that a casa should never trust its licensees? <laughs> 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 
But, but that's why I was talking about the reputation. Do we have a reputation to trust <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just not posing it hypothetically. I'm saying that whenever a regulator does its job and comes with something that it puts in a transparent manner in the public domain, because you are supposed to be an independent regulator, that can happen. If in your interactions with us, you find that the information is trustworthy and all, then it also verifies the trustworthiness of us as organizations, as operators. If, if I can just add to that, I think because of because this matter is something that has got a sort of an impact on industry, I think from that perspective, um, as Buck Amelia is saying, an, an objective audit is um, would probably be more appropriate um, for the purposes for which this information is going to be used. Um, not quite in the same question, but you said in your presentation that a regulatory impact assessment is necessary, <coughs> yet you support local loop and bundling through the Chapter 8 process. The Chapter 8 process doesn't require a regulatory impact assessment, it's a legal right to access seekers to all forms of network, and in this case, as we've heard argued, only the copper loop. So what is Vodacom arguing for here? Are you going to use local loop facilities if they're available? Do you care about a regulatory impact assessment as long as it doesn't affect you? Um, with regard to section 43 one, I mean that's a fact. That, that provision is in the Act and we cannot dispute the obligation that is imposed with regard to facilities in that. With regard to a regulatory impact assessment, we, th we believe that in principle it, it is always good practice to do an impact assessment with whatever um, regulatory interventions are done in the, in the sense that um, some unintended consequences may result from, from imposing remedies or, or intervening in certain areas without sort of assessing whether what the authority would like to achieve is in fact going to be achieved by such regulation also with regard to um, whether there's maybe other other means of doing so etc so from our view a regulatory impact assessment is good regulatory, regulatory practice that should be imposed when intervening it's essentially what I can say is that in almost, let me put it this way, in a number of CREA submissions, we have indicated the issue, whether it affects us or doesn't affect us. We have sort of indicated the issue of a need for regulatory impact assessment, which is essentially a cost-benefit analysis, nothing else. And that it, it, it is helpful, whether it's done or not. Of course, the practice is that it has never been done <laughs> in our environment, unfortunately. If it had happened, it would help a lot because it then indicates what exactly is the benefit of this for, for everybody, regardless of whether I'm a beneficiary or an unbeneficiary or it affects our infrastructure or not. Because even if it affects our infrastructure, that cost-benefit analysis or regulatory impact assessment indicates the value of doing what you're doing. Um, just, just to add on to it, I think with regard to local loop unbundling, I mean, there is still the need for the supplementary regulations. And I think the, the rules of, of exactly how local loop unbundling is going to happen and the access line deficit and all that, it still need to be made clear. So in that regard, I think even though the obligation is still there, I don't think a regulatory impact assessment would necessarily be wasted in this regard. So the regulatory impact assessment would allow you to have a common view uh, on the situation from 
one perspective, whereas otherwise you might uh, see different perspectives from different operators, and that could center on definitions that are used in assessing the state of the local loop, etc., etc. So at least now you would have a common standard or a common approach expressing the view on the situation against which all operators could uh, act. Are you? suggesting that our legislature was not aware of the obligations it was imposing on the people that had to comply with the Act, because are you saying that we have to do a regulatory impact assessment for every single right and obligation that a law imposes on citizens? Okay. Actually, even on policy making, even when you are putting a legislation in place, some of the, the calls now are to have an impact analysis of, 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 of the legislation that is put in place. I can, I can give some examples of well articulated cases of, of this problem, even from a legislative point of view. A practical example is where SAPS commented on the fact that on they, they are required to put people that have been subject of abuse in a place of safety. And that for, for policemen, what would they interpret as a place of safety? It's a cell where you, you, you put criminals on, which was not the intention of, of the legislature in putting that in place. So it, all, all I'm saying, Peter, is that even when a legislation is put in place, even when a policy is being put in place, these are activities that need to happen. A cost-benefit analysis of a legislation is appropriate and required because it helps to eliminate the unintended consequences and have a better balance on what you need to achieve. We, we, there is a practical example in our law where a clause was simply carried from the Telecoms Act into the EC Act, whether it had any relevance or not, and where the regulator then in, in, interpreted it to include mobile. Of course, at the time that the law was being written, there was not even a thought of mobile as being included under CPS. But by the time it, it was implemented, the EC Act was being implemented, and so you would remember some of the arguments in front of the regulator is that the, the it was at a, at a certain stage it was technically not possible but at a certain stage we couldn't argue on the technical possibility of it but rather on the whether it achieves any objectives so it, the cost benefit analysis or impact analysis assessment needs to be done by our society in general especially on legislations and regulations that are Peter, if I can just also answer your question with regard to whether the authority must do an impact assessment when implementing each and every rule that's already in the in the in the act. I don't think that is what we're saying. Because if if a if a law is already there, I mean the rules are there. However, where there's rules still that's yet to be clarified and yet to be put in place, in that instance we do believe it is appropriate. Um, just moving away from Rios, um, does Vodacom at the moment um, lease any wires from the customer to the exchange, um, including co-location equipment and so on, from Telcom? Just, I'm reading off the um, definition of an electronic communication facility, which says that a facility is any wire which can be used for or in connection with electronic communications, including where applicable co-location space, monitoring equipment, etc. So at, at the present moment, does Vodacom lease any wires within a local access network from Telcom? Certainly we do. 
And what are the terms and conditions associated with such a lease? Would they correspond to any of the forms of LLU that uh, we were considering here? I would have to go and have a look in more depth and detail to ascertain whether it corresponds or not. But it's not certainly done in the context of being a local loop that we are leasing. It is in the context of backhaul. And backhaul could be uh, far beyond local loop. So, you know, it depends on exactly the conditions that you are referring to. I think we would have to come back to you with a more considered opinion on that answer. But certainly we uh, do lease in circumstances like that. And some parts of that would not be part of that. We also lease space in telecom buildings. That's an answer to your question about co-location. So yes, we do lease space in telecom buildings. that unbundling the um, local loop would increase the number of fixed line in use? And, and lastly, do you believe that um, unbundling the local loop would improve the utilization of the capacity of the loops for copper and the associated network infrastructure? Uh, yes, um, there's been research shown, and I think MTN quoted the BT example, where faculty with you. Comes <laughs> the chair that quoted the BT example where Professor H mentioned earlier, was it last week, that after the introduction of local loop unbundling in the UK, the utilization of broadband increased. So the penetration of broadband increased in the UK. The in terms of what was the second part of the question? Okay, the second question, uh, do you believe that unbanking the local loop will improve the utilization of the uh, capacity of installed coffers and, and associated uh, infrastructure? Again, the answer would be yes. Uh, if you're looking at increasing penetration, that means you'll have more use of more lines that are installed. So, Telcom, I believe, has about four million, just over four million active lines, but the number of installed lines is far higher than that. I don't have to figure. So now for South Africa, once LLU is implemented, it would be easy to move up to the full capacity, whether it's eight million or six million, I have no idea. But it would be easy to increase the penetration without Telcom having to invest a lot more because the capacity is already there. It's just utilizing what is available, what is already installed. Uh, in your presentation, you stated that you support an uh, ordering system. Adding to that, uh, some form of ordering system will not doubt, be required to facilitate the energy. Who should you be responsible? Who should be responsible for its design, operation, and maintenance? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, um, if we look at mobile number portability, where, what happened there? We required an ordering system specification and this was developed by the industry but under the lead of the authority. We think something similar should happen here where the authority should take the lead but industry should be involved. My last question. Uh, in your submission, you see the view that uh, there is a requirement for transparency in respect of what telecom charges. This is a question of clarity. Uh, are you saying that the current telecom pricing, there is no transparency on it? Uh, 
I think our comments are with regard to the non-discrimination requirement because the requirement with non-discrimination is that you cannot charge somebody else more than what you charge yourself. So our comment is with regard to if if the other offer, if it's not clear and transparent what Telcom charges itself versus the other operators, then there won't be that transparency and it will not be sure how the non-discrimination um, requirement will be um, enforced. Um, with regard to transparency, with regard to what Telcom charge, I'm not in the position to respond to that question. Do you have any suggestion? How can we uh, improve on that? Our view is that at the end of the day, whatever disputes arise, for one or some other reason, will have to be adjudicated to by the regulator. And at the end of the day, the regulator has to put mechanisms where it can be adjudicated. Meaning, the provision of that information of what happens within Talbot should be provided to the regulator. But the, 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 what we're pointing out, that, that's, well, the transparency and so far as the, the party that's going to adjudicate is concerned. But what, what we're also pointing out is that in this case, we're supposed to access somebody's facilities at a particular level and determine whether my being charged on that, on that facility is not discriminating against me. And we don't we won't have information to make that decision. If I can sort of also just comment on that, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any suggestions with regard to how the authority at this stage should go about it. However, I agree with Papi Mili with regard to the fact that if there's a dispute, um, that should be dealt with the, with the authority. But I think also, in order to avoid the authority being um, sort of overridden with the disputes because of uncertainty in this regard, some transparency in general might be appropriate uh, because otherwise if there's uncertainty there might be a mini disputes coming to the authorities way. Do you know what Telcom charges MTN for similar services that you use with Telcom? And do you know what Telcom charges ATA for similar services that it offers you? If you don't, is this a concern about non-discrimination? We don't. And in actual fact, more than anything, it's only a requirement of the existing facilities leasing regulations that we have to file facilities leasing agreements. So it's only subsequent, it's only from beginning of this year that we could actually, if, I mean, if we have the access to those agreements, we could determine that we're being unfairly charged on one or some other basis, or we are unfairly charging somebody else on one or some other basis. But there's been no requirement before January 2011 to file facilities leasing agreements. And that database is a database that's only been created from the beginning of, uh, from January 2011 and July, June, June, July 2011 for the different facilities regulation, facilities leasing agreements that has been in existence before. Do you currently offer an APM service of product? Yes, we do. <coughs> And um, are you prepared to offer that product at what's your price? For us, it's just a service. And we offer it on the basis of competitiveness to the different parties. Would you consider that APN to be equivalent to Bitstream? Again, it's a service. Is that a yes or no? It's not equivalent technically. I'm not quite sure why you choose to use the term APN. APN refers to an access point name, which is really a routing methodology, which allows us to facilitate certain services 
on demand for corporates. So I'm not quite sure of the context that you're using the term APN, but it is an access point type, technically speaking, and it cannot be equated to Bitstream. Bitstream per se is a service. APN gives us the facility to facilitate a service. And the service is to grant certain specific features and functionality to a user in the packet service domain. It's almost like comparing apples to pears. Um, do you offer any MVN or services at the moment? Yeah, we only uh, provide uh, roaming to Samsung. In the event of a um, full local coming on board for the copper loop, would you consider using it? In the event of full local loop coming on board for the copper network, would you consider using it? Look, uh, essentially it depends on a lot of information that we still feel is inadequate. On the face of it, it may present an opportunity, but it depends. What is there at the end of the day? Okay, um, let me give a practical example. Let's say we wanted to provide a service like video on demand, and we wanted to use local loop unbundling to get to the end user. Then we would need to know the line length of the copper, the quality of the copper. And we would also need to know how many lines are installed in a specific area, we would look at the business case. So on a case-by-case -case basis, in each area we would examine it. But to say a blanket yes or no, it, we, we can't say that. We just say if there's a business case, we would examine it. So uh, just following up, so what, um, if you were to introduce a, a video on demand service, what form of LLU would you be looking for to carry that? Well, for, if we wanted to launch quickly, we would go with Bitstream immediately. And then as we invested more, we would move up to full loop unbundling and maybe even to sub loop unbundling where we take fiber to the street cabinet. Okay, uh, my last question. What comments, if any, do you have to make about um, the use of IP version 6 in the last mile? question to ask because I'm not sure the context of it. I mean, I, you know, IP version 6 is really a to to topic on its own uh, in an entirely different context to this. I mean, it's about working out uh, the future capacity within the IP domain of the network. So I'm not quite sure what the relevance of it is. The long term, in the context of, of a query around local loop unbundling specifically, in the longer term, we are moving, all moving towards IP version 6. It's a statement to make. Uh, it's a statement that you make outside of the concept of local loop unbundling. It's a general network wide statement. I've got two questions for Vodacom. I asked MTN this question. What is your view of the concept of purchasing outright geographic segments of the installed fixed line infrastructure from, you know, for example, local exchange complete down to, to the home? What's your view on that? And given that the ownership of radio apparatus is only of any value if you've got spectrum, would you not see spectrum plus radio apparatus actually being an economic facility and therefore a facility in itself? I 
much take the questions in sequence, but uh, in terms of purchasing lock, stock and barrel, that would be very much a case-by-case -case <coughs> assessment that you have to make because uh, not all of the equipment <coughs> concerned uh, is necessarily relevant to the type of markets or services that we operate or provide. So consequently, you've got to do uh, an analysis of what technologies are deployed, uh, the capabilities of those technologies, the cost effectiveness of it, uh, what we already deploy in similar areas, etc., and then make a call on that basis. So <coughs> I think it would be very unlikely that we would ever go down that route, lock, stock, and barrel. But there might be some specific instances or aspects to consider. What was the <coughs> first part of the question again, if you don't mind? The second part of the question is, is that the ownership of radio apparatus is of no value if you haven't got spectrum. <coughs> if, you have to, if you have to provide access to radio apparatus, don't you have to provide access to the assigned spectrum at the same time? give us some more context to the question, we could better answer the question in that, uh, technically speaking, obviously radio equipment cannot be operated without uh, spectrum, so I'm not quite sure, you know, what the thrust of the question is, if you could just elaborate and I can try and give you a more accurate reply. You've indirectly answered the question by saying, uh, the way I interpret it is what you've said is yes. What I'm saying is radio apparatus is a facility defined in the act. You have an obligation to lease that said facility as defined in the Act. That facility is of no value to you or to anybody else without spectrum. So by leasing that facility, you effectively share spectrum. And how can you not share radio apparatus without sharing allocated spectrum? Sharing of that base is very technically complex in there. For example, it would be possible if someone else, and I'm not talking about within the legislative realm that we have in the country at the moment, but I'm talking about at a purely technical level. If someone else provided spectrum and we provided uh, the radio equipment, we could certainly still facilitate at a technical level, not within the regulatory legal aspect of it now, but you could certainly facilitate uh, utilizing their spectrum on your radio equipment, for example. So it's not so that the person has to only use the spectrum that you are assigned on your radio equipment. It depends on the nature of the radio equipment. It depends on the nature of sharing because there's various forms of sharing. And it's actually quite a technically complex issue. Uh, passive sharing, active sharing, we can go down a whole realm of answers to the question. But just to put your mind at ease, the person does not have to utilize the spectrum assigned to us as Vodacom in order to use our radio. Um, just looking at um, some of the complexity around um, local loop unbundling, do you think it would be simpler to move towards a structural separation of telecoms, retail and wholesale business? Would there be sufficient demand in the uh, communication sector in the country to justify the cost of doing something like that? regard to structural separation as a remedy or intervention, um, I believe it is a very um, harsh method of intervening. And in that regard, I believe should an authority consider structural intervention, it should be the last resort. In the sense of uh, when you look at, at proportionality requirement with regard to um, imposing remedies, um, I believe that structural um, separation should be the only way of remedying some competition problem in the market. 
and if there's any other way of remedying um, any problem that might exist, the, the least intrusive remedy should then actually be imposed. So I think it's something that the authority should consider when they, when they think about um, st strictly separating telecom is whether it is the last resort, whether it is the only way of remedying a certain um, problem in the market. And I think that is, that, what, that is what needs to inform a decision in that regard. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the, from the audience? Have them quickly, please. We're running out of time. <laughs> From Lionel Swartz, also of A D V I N E B N N E. How do you pronounce that? Advert. <coughs> That's a lot of comments regarding MVNOs. There are two questions here. One is, are you willing to allow an MVNO or MVNE on the Vodacom network if the authority published regulations for national roaming? Essentially, if a casa does so, it's part of an engagement. And as, as far as we would have no choice, we'll be part and parcel of that engagement. And if that's the result of it, then we'll provide it. Thank you. The second question is Are you willing to hand back unused spectrum, specifically in the 900? Uh, 1800 and 2100 bands, especially in rural and small towns where there's no penetration. Firstly, I must just correct the uh, person who asked the question. In rural areas, in particular instances, there are very high demands on certain of those spectrum bands that have been mentioned. The demand on the spectrum band depends on the penetration of the type of cell phone in question. Also depends on the cell density in the area as to the ability for you to create pseudo capacity in that area through frequency reuse of 2G for example. So the point about it is it's a misnomer to state that in rural areas there isn't a high demand on spectrum. It depends on network topology, it depends on the demand in the area and in some of the rural areas we have very, very high demand for a variety of reasons. Some of them technically, as I just said, because of the network topology, but some of them just through straight utilization and straight penetration of certain phone times. So indeed, in some of the rural areas, we have significant capacity constraints on some of the bands in question. But we have a good you know, a very good track record of continually continue monitoring and improving on the efficiency of spectrum, and we're certainly not a company would abide by the wastage of spectrum per se. In essence, we don't have our new spectrum. <coughs> and then the third, the third question from the same, the same uh, member of the public is: Are your requirements for national roaming the same as for international networks roaming in South Africa, and which regulate regulations govern this decision? <coughs> are your requirements for national roaming? the same as for international networks which are running in South Africa. So this is presumably for a South African running and a non-South African company both running in South Africa. It's actually quite a complex question again to reply to from a purely technical perspective there are indeed a great deal of similarities between uh, how you facilitate international and local roaming, but obviously from uh, a commercial perspective there are different considerations in regards to the, 
and so there would be you know some fundamentally different requirements which I would not like to speak to here and I think we as Vodacom would like to answer in a more considered manner perhaps in writing but so what I'm saying is there, there are clearly differences between international and local roaming at a commercial level that we would need to elaborate on in more depth but if you're talking purely at a technical level there are some technical similarities between the two issues though of course there are also key technical differences as to where uh, physically some of the infrastructure is situated, etc. Thank you. Would, be, would you be so kind as to do that in a written response within 14 days? Thank you very much.